My name is Sky Huddleston. I've been a protege of Roger Richard and an advanced engine researcher for the last 10 years. I've been a mechanical engineer and a thermodynamic researcher into combustion systems such as wood and pellet stoves and internal combustion engines for a very long time. And I have continued the development of Scotch oak and internal combustion engines to greatly increase their efficiency, their power, their torque, their reliability and their longevity and their ease of maintenance to create a design that I believe and I'm strongly convicted in my opinion that it will be better than any other conventional engine ever yet devised before by every metric and I have physical testing to prove it. So a conventional piston engine can't detonate the fuel. They are isobaric in nature. What this means is that they operate with constant pressure heat addition which is inherently less efficient than constant volume heat addition systems. So <clears throat> if you have a piston you understand that explosions make them operate, but the explosions in a conventional piston engine are always subsonic, and the way that these engines extract heat, any engine, is through expansion of the gas to perform mechanical energy, and that's true whether you're talking about a turbine or a piston engine. And so if you compress your fuel and air mixture and you burn your fuel, you want the full stroke of expansion to convert heat into mechanical energy. If you add heat here, you only have half of the stroke to increase your volume and thus convert heat into mechanical energy so anything that oxidizes after top dead center is being more and more wasteful the further and further you get away from top dead center so what we want is pure isochoric constant volume heat addition by burning 100 percent of the fuel at top dead center and none of the fuel after top dead center this can only be achieved through detonation i.e isochoric heat addition to that end, we've developed a Fickett Jacob cycle engine, so it's not an auto cycle, it's not a diesel cycle, it is a Fickett Jacob cycle, so it is pure isochoric heat addition, which is more efficient than the Humphrey, Brayton, or Rankine cycle, respectively. Electric vehicles are fine and dandy, except for the fact that you have to buy electricity from the grid to power them, unless you have a very expensive off-grid setup, such as wind and solar panels. They also lack the energy density and the range because batteries would have to increase their energy density by about 3,000% to compete with the density of liquid hydrocarbons. In this setup, we can actually burn abundant fuel sources such as waste vegetable oil, charcoal or coal water slurries, burnt brake fluid, <clears throat> crude oil, natural gas, etc. And assuming you have this generator hooked up to the natural gas grid, you will be able to produce your own electricity at a cost 40, 44% less than the cost of grid delivered electricity. Wow. Another, another advantage that we have over electric vehicles is that we're going to be integrating a <clears throat> integral hydraulic motor pump for the crankcase and this will be used to provide for hydraulic regenerative braking and power assisted takeoff which will offer more torque from zero than an electric motor and it will be unable to burn out unlike an electric motor that's overloaded so we'll get a faster acceleration rate than an electric vehicle more torque and a higher degree of reliability and longevity than an electric vehicle because electric vehicles necessitate cooling back in the 1970s uh, Cummins and TACOM in conjunction with the U.S. Army developed what they called the adiabatic engine program and this engine program was designed to eliminate the coolant system which the Army identified was the cause of 60 percent of mechanical breakdowns of vehicles in combat situations and so by eliminating the coolant system they made the vehicles over a hundred percent more efficient and because electric vehicles still need coolant systems for their batteries and especially their electric motors and our new prototypes won't need a coolant system we're actually going to be more reliable than an electric vehicle. The way that we achieve our isochoric constant volume heat addition is through detonation and detonation destroys normal engines. A typical conventional engine with its wiggling connecting rod setup induces a lot of piston side thrust. It also has secondary forces and imbalancement. With a scotch yoke mechanism, there are only primary forces. There are no secondary forces, and in multi-bank arrangements such as 8-cylinder and 12-cylinder engines, we won't need to have any counterweights, so our rotating mass is greatly diminished. This is achieved through the use of the scotch yoke, which also eliminates the piston side thrust, which is a large contributing factor of in-cylinder wear. By eliminating the piston side thrust and keeping the connecting rod straight at all times, this also isolates the crankcase and hydraulic oil 
from the combustion byproducts of blow-by and it also allows us to do something very interesting by eliminating the head gasket we can have monocoque construction combustion chambers meaning that through the removal of four nuts we can pull off the entire combustion chamber and top overhaul the engine in five minutes with one wrench so here you can see the piston the wrist pin the combustion chamber all comes off and then we can actually pull off the mechanism that holds the wrist pin on in the single acting versions and then we can access these bronze bushings that the connecting rods reciprocate in and so the entire engine can be top overhauled in five minutes with one wrench and a simple cover plate bolts onto this bolt hole pattern and this is what stabilizes the crankshaft and pulling that off allows you to completely maintain your entire crankshaft and your crankcase again with only one wrench with bare simple tools and materials so it's very user serviceable and maintainable which neither electric vehicles nor conventional engine vehicles are. So we greatly reduce the cost of manufacture because we only have two moving parts. We greatly increase the reliability and the longevity because of the simplicity, the elimination, total elimination of side thrust. We greatly increase the efficiency. This engine has it, uh, we've dyno tested this engine and it has a thermal efficiency of 51.4%, which means <clears throat> that we effectively have the most efficient engine in the world for a given stroke to bore ratio because our engines are over square, meaning that their stroke is shorter than the bore and operating with a 51.4% efficiency with an over square engine is unheard of. So we have the most efficient engine in the world for a given stroke to bore ratio. Another thing that this design allows us to do is through the process of detonation, now we can run as high of a compression ratio as our material strengths will allow, meaning that our new prototypes can run with compression ratios upwards of 300 to 1, and the original Burke engines have a compression ratio of 30 to 1. Now that's static compression ratio, not dynamic, but even the dynamic compression ratio is still going to be very high. So because we can hook this up to a Griggs type hydrosonic cavitation pump and convert this engine into a true multi-fuel engine, now we can use tire derived fuels, we can use thermal depolymerized municipal solid waste and sewage, offal, etc. So now we have a very clean, very efficient way of converting waste streams into clean electrical or mechanical power, which is going to eliminate the need for landfills. Well, I was a child of poverty, and so we never had new cars or new trucks or new vehicles or equipment. And so I became quickly aware of how fast conventional engines broke down, wore out, how unreliable and untenable they were and how inefficient they were. You know, not being able to go places or do things or get things because of gas money or, you know, the lack thereof or because of the unreliability of conventional engine design. And then when I became a truck driver in 88 Mike for the U.S. Army, it became a matter of life and death. And it really, you know, having that experience as a child, helping my father attempt to repair conventional engines, overhaul them, despite not having the proper tools because we didn't have the money for new cars. It really drove home the fact that this is really a matter of life and death and inspired me to do a lot of work researching engines, how they work, how they operate, why they are designed the way that they are, and I wanted to solve these systemic issues that have plagued internal combustion design practices for decades that have been predicated upon false axioms such as the idea that a piston engine can't detonate the fuel when that's not true. Allowing the detonation of the fuel by eliminating the head gaskets, by eliminating wiggling connecting rods, by eliminating all of these systemic issues now means we can eliminate the ignition system, go to a pure compression ignition system, which the ignition system is a large contributing factor to the unreliability of engines. We can eliminate carbon fouling. We can eliminate crankcase blow-by. We can eliminate oil contamination. There's a lot of issues that this design, once modernized and developed, can and will eliminate, and it's going to allow us to build an engine with a lifespan upwards of 10 million miles, and it's so easy to overhaul that a person can overhaul it in 30 minutes with a few hand tools and be good for another 10 million miles. Our measured EGTs right out of the ports of these original engines are 220 degrees to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, meaning that we have the lowest EGTs under load of any engine in the world because of that isochoric constant volume pulse detonation heat addition, and that is the biggest contributor to our overall thermal efficiency and why we are so efficient. So this original single acting engine was developed by Russell Burke in the early 20th century. He was an, a mechanic and a trainer in the U.S. Army Air Corps during World War I and after seeing the failure of conventional designs and too many aviators dying due to the unreliability 
and inefficiencies and complexities of conventional engines. This engine only has two moving parts, conventional engines have hundreds. He became inspired to design an engine that wouldn't kill people, that wouldn't kill aviators, and that would be much more efficient and reduce strains on the logistics and supply lines and allow people to keep going for a longer duration and maintain their systems much more easily. And so over the period of 20 years, he developed this engine using the novel Scotch yoke mechanism and with great effect. And this was all done from the 19 teens all the way through and into the 1940s. And <clears throat> big credit to Russell Burke for developing the Scotch yoke mechanism because of its phenomenal efficiencies. We can now have pure isochoric constant volume heat addition in our engines. And as you can see, one of the advantages of the Scotch yoke mechanism, given how it operates, is that it eliminates all of the secondary forces that plague conventional engines. Conventional engines with their wiggling connecting rods, the top 180 degrees of rotation has a higher mean piston speed than the bottom 180 degrees of rotation. The Scotch yoke mechanism allows us to achieve a maximum piston and rod assembly velocity at 90 degrees to crank angularity, meaning that there's no secondary forces. We have pure sinusoidal wave function of our reciprocating mass, so an eight-cylinder version or engine can be made without any counterweights and still be perfectly balanced just by ensuring that every one of your piston rod and yoke assemblies are the exact same weight. So our company name is Eternal Engines. We haven't really gone public yet. This is our first public venue. <clears throat> we don't have a website set up, but we do have eternalengines.com that will be up once we are ready to start, you know, once we get through a lot of our early development phases, which we have largely gone through when, our, when our, we are in our last engineering cycle, we have a 50cc engine that we're trying to bring to market. It's going to be double acting rather than single acting, so it has a plethora of advantages over the original Burke engine. And it's going to have a phenomenal power to weight ratio. The original Burke engine only had a power to weight ratio of about 4 horsepower per pound, which is phenomenal in its own right, but our double acting engines are going to have a power to weight ratio upwards of 10 horsepower per pound with an overall higher degree of thermal efficiency. So there's a lot of places we're planning on taking this, a lot of things we can do with this design, and we're really looking forward to developing and commercializing this technology to get it in the hands of people to increase their quality of life. My long-term goal is the total decentralization of electricity and energy production by giving everyone a full megawatt of mechanical power, which then they can produce a full megawatt of electrical power if they so choose to do so, on demand at their fingertips at any given time, and the grid, wind, and solar will never be able to do that. So originally, I, uh, Roger Richard was supposed to be a speaker originally for the Burke engine and Scotch Oak engine technology but he had various medical issues that popped up suddenly because he's a Vietnam veteran, a very elderly gentleman, and he was uh, contaminated, exposed to Agent Orange, and so he had some medical issues that popped up that he had to deal with immediately, and so he called and asked me, I'm his protege, to fill in for him, and that's what brought me here to Aaron Murakami's Energy Science and Technology Conference, and it's been quite the interesting experience. I've learned a lot myself, and I've met a lot of interesting and unique people, and it's been a very, very positive experience for me. Um, it's definitely interesting. I've had a lot of criticisms of my work over the past with not a lot of uh, positive compliments, and every time I receive a criticism, it just more doggedly puts me on a more dogged determination to solve any systemic issue that they've identified or make redundant any not problem that they think is a problem that's not a problem and to redund create redundant solutions to make it not a problem twice over.